Today I wanted to talk about Facebook's role in potentially exacerbating a humanitarian crisis in Ethiopia. And when I say potentially, I'm earnest about that. At least I think I am. Someone saying that they're earnest about something probably lowers the likelihood that they are earnest about it. But in the spirit of full disclosure and transparency, I do think I uh, am honest about trying to objectively evaluate whether or not Facebook shirked its responsibility in the events that have taken place in Ethiopia. Before going into details on how an internet platform can act in accordance with a set of values and proceed in a direction that not only is good from a commercial perspective, but also from a societal perspective. I wanted to explain, or at least not explain, I wanted to touch on some events that have occurred in Ethiopia over the last 50 years or so, which hopefully will be able to clarify some of the thornier struggles, issues, conundrums that are presented to a company like Facebook. And apologies in advance if some of these events that I'm about to go over in Ethiopia are cherry picked. I've been looking into the history of Ethiopia for only a matter of days to be able to understand what has gone on in the country, to be able to understand and articulate and form my own opinion of what the role of internet platforms are. So I'm not an expert on, on Ethiopia, on Ethiopian history, but it's important to touch on this topic before going into something that I do have more experience um, and knowledge about. Ethiopia is a powder keg. It went through a brutal decades-long civil war from the 70s to the 90s in which 1.4 million people died, 400,000 from Conflict, military conflict, another one million from famine. The Ethiopian government is organized via a concept of ethnic federalism. So there's more than 80 ethnicities recognized within Ethiopia. Three of the most prominent are Tigres, three of the most prominent ethnicities. One is Tigray, another is Amhara, another is Oromo. And after the Ethiopian Civil War ended in 1991, the Tigrays gained a considerable amount of power, probably an outsized amount of power compared to the number of Tigrayans in the country. 
There's only 6% more or less Tigrayan population within Ethiopia, but it had most of the political power coming out of the civil war in the 1990s. And the Oromos and the Amharas are two of the most popul populist, pop populous ethnicities within Ethiopia. And there has always been an undercurrent of ethnic tensions, or there has been for a number of decades. And in 2014, the government rolled out a plan to expand the boundaries of the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. And Addis Ababa is in the Aromia region of Ethiopia that's comprised mainly of Aromos. And this plan was met with significant resistance and protests from mainly Aromo, those of the Aromo ethnicity. They were worried that the expansion of the capital city would encroach upon farmers, Aromo farmers in the region. And this protest was handled poorly by the government. Protesters were killed by security forces. It ignited more anger and violence. There was a musician, Hachalu Hundessa, an Oromo who at age 17 was imprisoned for five years for attending a protest. And while in jail, he wrote a number of songs that would be included in his album when he got out of jail, Sanyi Muti. And in the subsequent years, became more and more popular. He became more and more of a powerful voice for the Oromo people against marginalization. And his protest songs were a galvanizing force during the 2014 to 2016 protests against the government plan to expand the capital into Oromo farmlands. It became so popular that the protests forced the government to scrap the plan and catapulted a fellow Oromo, Abai Ahmed, to the prime ministership of Ethiopia in 2018. And in the first months of Mr. Abai's tenure, the results were encouraging. According to a UN report, government lifted the state of emergency, freed journalists and political prisoners, authorized the operation of previously banned opposition groups, halted rampant government censorship, and charged a number of military and civilian figures with corruption. The government continued by launching a formal process of legal and institutional reform, introducing a public participatory process of legislative drafting and advice, which the UN considered to be a model for democratic processes worldwide. However, those early encouraging signs gave way to more troubling events. In August 2020, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, elections were suspended indefinitely. In fact, another civil war erupted in 2020 in the Tigray region of the country. Thankfully, after two years of bloodshed, atrocities, the 
Tigrayans and the Ethiopian government agreed to a peace no negotiation in November of 2022. During the most recent civil war, Prime Minister Abai has referred to Tigrayans as a devil, a cancer, a weed. And it was during this period of conflict and chaos that the musician Kuchalo Hundessa was assassinated in June 2020. In the wake of his assassination, chaos began to ensue. Thousands of mourners that gathered at the hospital where Hachalu was taken were dispersed by police via tear gas. Two people were shot dead and seven others injured at his funeral. In protests in the subsequent days throughout the Aromia region, roughly 160 people ended up dead. To bring it back to Facebook and to examine, evaluate what actions are appropriate for internet platforms to put into place in these situations that are incredibly tense incredibly urgent with an extreme amount of pressure in a short period of time. The company has received some criticism for being a quote-unquote breeding ground for hate and fomenting anger amongst the Oromo ethnic group and making it more likely that the violence that was carried out was to occur. So it made that violence more likely. However, the internet was shut down at 9 a.m. the day after Hachalu's assassination. So presumably many who participated in the protests and in the violence were not able to access posts on, on Facebook and the virali virality of vengeance that, <clears throat> excuse me, that many posts demonstrated. Another Oromo activist, Jawar Muhammad, responded to Hachalu's death on Facebook saying, they did not just kill Hachalu, they shot at the heart of the Oromo nation once again. You can kill us, all of us. You can never ever stop us, never. So where does the responsibility lie? Facebook didn't force Jawar Muhammad to make those comments. Part of me thinks that blaming Facebook on the unrest that occurred in Ethiopia following Hachalu Hundessa's assassination is similar to blaming radio waves for the genocide in Rwanda in which Hutus explicitly called for violence via a radio station. But where the company deserves a considerable amount of criticism and where the company needs to reform itself is in
their assuredness of the righteousness of their cause, their certainty in the belief that they can do no wrong. I come to that conclusion after taking a deeper look into some of the claims that the company made in a blog post entitled, An Update on Our Longstanding Work to Protect People in Ethiopia, published in November of 2021. One of these claims includes that the company has made it easier for Ethiopians as well as specialized international and local human rights and civil society organizations to tell us when they see potentially violating content so we can investigate it for possible violations. According to the Council on Foreign Relations, Meta has partnered with two civil society organizations dedicated to content moderation. Combined, these two companies have five employees devoted to scanning content posted by Ethiopia's 7 million users. Meta also notes that we have technology to identify hate speech in Amharic and Aroma before anyone reports it to us. These efforts are industry leading. An organization called Global Witness tested this claim by the company that their technology was industry leading. What Global Witness did was take 12 ads that were some of the most egregious violators of the company's policy against hate speech in Amharic. These ads were reported to Facebook and some of them were taken down from the platform and included, among other things, calls for human beings to be killed, starved, or cleansed. And when Global Witness submitted these ads for publication on the Facebook platform, all 12 were accepted. When the organization Global Witness contacted Meta about this inconsistency. A spokesperson said that the ads shouldn't have been approved in the first place as they violate Meta's policies. We've invested heavily in safety measures in Ethiopia, adding more, uh, building more capacity, catch hateful. Despite these investments, we know that there will be gaps. As both machines and people make. Listen, if you don't. If you are unable to perform a task, come out and say that you're unable to do that. The worst thing that you can do is claim that you are capable of doing something when it's demonstrably false. And in this case, Facebook has said that their content moderation software is able to identify hate speech and call and explicit calls for violence. I want to make that clear. Explicit calls for violence for people to be starved, killed, and cleansed. The company's response and comments about their operations in Ethiopia are just but one example of
a culture propagated within the company that disregards the truth and only emphasizes the rosiest of outlooks in terms of the actions that have been taken. And I guess this is to sort of take off the mask a little bit. I think the consequences are profound. And devastating. I hope calling out hypocrisies like what is what has happened with Meta's claims around its actions around Ethiopia make it easier to identify those hypocrisies going forward and make them less acceptable. Make the truth of what's actually going on appear closer in the distance because put years and years and years of half-truths and falsehoods on top of one another, it becomes more and more difficult to find an accurate representation of what is actually going on. In the worst case scenario, we have to eliminate the worst case scenario, which is that things like the Facebook al algorithm have pointed our attention and focus in a direction that is not only unproductive, but it's damaging to nearly every aspect of our lives. I hope that's an overstatement, but I don't know that it is. So what's the answer? How, how do we move forward? I think companies like Facebook need to publish anonymized raw data regarding ads on their platform, regarding how their algorithm chooses what content to put in front of users and how their algorithms deem content to be or not to be hate speech. This will allow independent researchers to
test hypotheses regarding the effectiveness of the company's operations and demonstrate on the part of Facebook a sincere desire to get the solution to this problem handled appropriately.